In autumn 2011, a geeky 12-year-old, I was a dedicated passenger on the Minecraft hype train. And when two of my favourite YouTubers joined the same server around the same time, I was excited as can be. I'd heard of Minecraft before Etho and Andazel joined the member list, but from that point I was invested. I stuck around for the Season 3 Golden Age, continued watching throughout Season 4, and caught a little bit of Season 5 as well. At its peak, keeping up with Minecraft was an absolute delight and as utterly addictive as the name suggests. Every day would bring multiple new videos, updating me on the progress of the various members as they worked on their bases, scattered across the gigantic world map. Each location became a home from home, a place as real and familiar to me as home, church, school, Kurt's missile silo, Pause's tree and floating pyramid on the other side of the ocean, Beef's Adlington's and the Jim's castles, Badge's Mycalls and Jay Sano's villages, Zisto's crazy lens thing, the mysterious Arcus's awe-inspiring mothership, Shree's and MC's underwater palaces, Nebris's beautiful monstrosity, whatever it was. But more than that, each episode felt like a tantalising glimpse into the mind of the man behind the pickaxe. It felt like I was getting to know them all in the most parasocial sense possible. And whenever one guy cameoed on another's video or visited another's base, it was a special joy adding to the mystique of the place. Minecraft was absolutely a place as a connected community, when in reality most people tended to stay in their own secluded corner of the world doing their own thing. The UHCs, especially the quintessential and pioneering UHC 3, in which several members were dropped in random locations on a brand new world where they gathered resources for a fight to the death. These were tense, compelling and compulsive viewing, and did a lot to elevate the server's community aspect from a nice idea in theory, to a critical part of its appeal. These were friends who actually played together, and just happened to be watched by tens of thousands of young adolescents across the world. This magic was mostly maintained throughout Season 4, despite, or perhaps aided by, the inevitable Rost changes. One big change that left a sour taste in many viewers' mouths took place just after Good, the server's founder and boss, decided to register the name Minecraft as a trademark, and do a few other things which were generally vague doubt for the young audience. I tried hard to believe the claims that nothing was really going to change, but deep down it felt like Minecraft was selling out, going corporate, and becoming a bit less legit. In hindsight, that reaction seems kind of silly. Many Mindcrackers were already fully professional YouTubers, and it made perfect sense to streamline branding and licensing stuff I don't understand, and to make everything a bit more official. But there must have been something in the small print that wasn't so small after all, as it caused several high-profile members to leave at the same time. That included Paul Soares Jr., the server's biggest catch in terms of viewer base, and the first ever big Minecraft video maker, and my parasocial pal Etho. I continued to watch, of course, but after a while, oversaturated by increasingly same UHCs, discouraged by the dwindling number of videos released from the main server, I began to grow a bit jaded. Good seemed to be trying to offset the second problem by adding a fair number of new members, but I never got into their videos, and I don't think they posted many anyway. And I just couldn't bring myself to be interested in this new generation of face cam let's players. Us sophisticated Minecraft fans could always claim superiority over those lowbrow Philistine Yogscast fans, even though we all guiltily watched Shadow of Israfel anyway. Way, but we no longer had a leg to stand on in that regard. And besides all that stuff, my own interests were changing, as they always have done and always will do. People my age stopped playing that kid's game. Minecraft got me on Reddit, and Reddit helped me get off Minecraft with help from a couple of other fascinations. Season 5 was basically dead in the water. I believe that a video where Shri was working on a desert fortress was the last Minecraft video I watched, in between listening to all of Prog Rock. It was a good run, and it produced some great memories but it was well and truly over. And nothing like it could ever come again, now that the Minecraft bubble had burst. Now the thing about my interests is that they never really die. Anything I've ever got into is always sitting on the back burner, waiting to be promoted to the front ring whenever the season turns. It was the same thing with Minecraft. Every so often, I'd boot up the game, start a new world, realise what a noob I'd become and switch it off again. I'd check if Kurt was still stolidly walking in one direction for charity. He was. If Etho was still adding bafflingly complex machines to a single-player world, he was. These were perfectly preserved relics of a bygone era, showing me a wistful half an hour of misplaced 2012 before kicking me back out, reminding me of all that was lost. One day I looked up Doc M's channel on a whim, to see whether he was still somehow doing the Minecraft thing. I seem to remember him displacing it from his channel with other games completely, but sure enough, I could see episodes of Hermitcraft Season 6 going into triple digits, so I watched a few. In one, he expresses his happiness at the fact that Minecraft had become popular again. That was news to me, so I watched some video essay explaining why. Around this time, I found a series where Team Canada, one of the mainstay groups in Old Minecraft, were playing an adventure map. 
it was just like old times, and I mean just like. The shot of nostalgia, combined with the fact that it was happening now, made for a deliciously intoxicating mix. It could happen again. It was happening again. I've also got to mention Zisto Plays Minecraft Beta 1.8, released around this time, which is a masterclass in mystery and absurd observational humour. Please give that a watch if you're at all intrigued. Minecraft was well and truly at the front of my mind again. I'd subscribed back to Etho for old time's sake, and was greatly enjoying his Terra Firma Punk series when Hermitcraft 7 Episode 1 showed up. Him and Doc M were on that server? I was intrigued, I had to take a look. When B-dubs, another ex-Minecracker, turned up in Doc's video, I was invested. Those three's videos would be plenty to refill my parched nostalgia gland, and the Swedish, over-enthusiastic, heavily catchphrase-reliant Coralis would make for a decent PG replacement for the 15-rated Andazel. I had to know who else was on the server. Not to watch them too, I just couldn't bear not knowing. And in the list on the website, among all the mostly unfamiliar names, Vintage Beef, one of the longest serving Minecrackers, present months before Season 3 and remaining well past the fateful trademark, was now an active member of Hermitcraft, alongside three of his compatriots. In my mind, it was clear that the baton had been well and truly passed. Before I knew it, I was watching videos from most server members. It almost felt beyond my control. The Minecraft vibe was so unbelievably strong. The community, all on the same team, feel, the universal proficiency at the game, the sheer quantity of video being posted, the silly, friendly jibes, the role-playing, exaggerated but not excessive, the amount of fun everyone seemed to be having, but it was bigger. With more active members and so many more viewers, there were actually women on the server, all of whom British, which gave me a pleasantly patriotic glow, and the members' dedication to their craft and making beautiful and impressive things was enviable. Sure, not everything was fantastic. The number of people watching Hermitcraft 7 can feel somewhat intimidating, and what's more, Hermitcraft today is far more corporate than Minecraft ever was. Calls to action litter the videos, caps lock and exclamation marks litter their titles, and everything's just that bit sterile to make it advertiser friendly. Oh, and by the way, the server's economy is, if you actually think about it, anarcho-capitalist. Like, properly. But my new favourites, Zedaf and Joe Hills, have sensible video titles, refreshingly few subscribers, delightfully unique ways of playing the game, and fantastic senses of humour to boot. That's more than enough to make up for the faint whiff of supermarket the other hermits can sometimes give off. So, to summarise, sometimes things seem to be even better than you remember them with your rose-tinted hindsight. Stop being so negative about nostalgia. Sometimes it's absolutely correct. So I got into Hermitcraft at last. I'd known about Generic B's server for many years, since before he'd affected to Minecraft during Season 3. When the founder of one server joins its more popular rival, it's pretty clear which way the traffic's flowing. Hermitcraft didn't have the same associated online community, I simply didn't have the time or interest to keep up with it, and that made it safe to ignore. I was Mumbo Jumbo's 99th subscriber back in the day. Before jumping off his channel when I decided he was too good at YouTube, I evidently thought it safe to ignore the fact that he'd joined Hermitcraft, to such an extent that I totally forgot he was on it for years. When several Minecrackers were invited to the server, they only made one or two videos there before also evidently deciding it was safe to ignore. How the tables have turned. I genuinely feel sorry for Good, still pumping out Minecraft Season 7 videos to a dwindling number of faithful, while Generic B's server is consistently raking in millions of hits, thousands of likes, and trending awards on all sides. Beef, probably the most nostalgic of the ex-Minecraft hermits, has said he'd love Good to join, thus finally completing the circle. It seems extremely far-fetched to me, especially considering his penchant for dirty stories and, regrettably, his totally off-the-radar status as a YouTuber, but one can dream. Then, along comes a certain virus, and, hot on its heels, this strange new concept of self-isolation. No longer do I have to feel guilty about watching other people play Minecraft 24-7. Instead, I can feel virtuous about not going outside and helping slow the rate of infection. Rather than watching lots of Hermitcraft, I started watching all the Hermitcraft. I'd essentially flunked the term anyway, so surely it couldn't do any harm to put all my effort into that, and none whatsoever into work. I'm very good at getting addicted to things. I'd resolved to stop once I came home from university, redirecting my concentration into writing and recording music, my most favourite things to do. But no. As the days went by, I couldn't separate myself from it. In my head I was 12 again, wondering who I'd get to parasocially meet today, waiting to submerge myself in a world full of colourful cubes, calming commentary, carefully calculated and effortlessly practised cheerfulness, and the beauty of ambitions fulfilled. Truly crack for my mind. I knew it was unhealthy, and wondered at how unhealthy it must have been for me doing the same thing back in 2012. 
But I was honestly having too much fun to really care much. I felt I was getting to know these people, if only a cultivated version of the side that they show on screen. I was even beginning to stop resenting the more popular hermits for having multiple million subscribers. This was my reality TV. It was almost at the point of becoming my reality. So what changed? Well, nothing yet. However, whether or not this story gets turned into a video at any point in time, it feels good to get my thoughts on paper and to come clean. 